Remember that our encounter with the Afghan tragedy did not begin on the morning of September 11, 2001. It began when the first Soviet troops marched into Afghanistan in December 1979. It began when the first of what would at one point become five million Afghan refugees came to Pakistan. That is how long the people of Pakistan have suffered the blowback from conflict and instability in Afghanistan. It is now 40 years and counting. For context, just remember, this is more than half of our life as an independent nation. Let me also add that since 9-11 alone, over 70,000 Pakistani security forces and civilians have made the ultimate uh, sacrifice in the fight against terrorism. Our economy has suffered over $150 billion in direct economic losses, the indirect costs that the war against terrorism has imposed by disrupting our natural economic trajectory is just incalculable. Both Pakistan and the US have shed too much blood and expended too much treasure. We want to honor the memory of our fallen soldiers and countrymen by successfully accomplishing the mission in Afghanistan. Pakistan had long argued that there is no military solution to Afghanistan. Prime Minister Imran Khan was one of the first leaders in the region who consistently advocated a political route towards peace in Afghanistan. This is why we welcome President Trump's bold initiative for promoting a political settlement in Afghanistan. Pakistan's positive role in facilitating the Afghan peace process, including the Taliban-US talks, is internationally acknowledged. There is hope today that 2020 could be the year for peace in Afghanistan. While we have made significant progress, much more needs to be done. Patience and perseverance are indispensable. We need to remember that peace in Afghanistan is ultimately a shared responsibility. Pakistan will and is playing its role, but it alone cannot do all that is needed. The international community and important regional players have to play their part. At the same time, we have to be vigilant against spoilers. Sadly, not every country in the broader region wants to see peace in Afghanistan. While we sincerely work for peace in Afghanistan, we must also sharpen our focus on preparations for the post-conflict phase. Pakistan hopes that there would be no precipitate action and that international withdrawal would be phased and orderly. It is in no one's interest to repeat the mistakes of the 1980s. Continued international engagement for reconstruction and sustained development would be pivotal. It would also help create conditions for the honorable return of Afghan refugees in Pakistan and elsewhere. We hope that the United States and other partners would work with Pakistan as we politically mainstream and economically develop our uh, former tribal areas. Economic activity along the Afghanistan-Pakistan border would, be benefit, uh, would benefit both sides. There is another compelling reason for us to see peace firmly established in Afghanistan. For too long, Pakistan-US relationship has remained hostage to the Afghan issue. We want this rather unhelpful framework to change. Pakistan-US relations are too significant and possess too huge a potential to be confined to the Afghan prism alone. Peace in Afghanistan will help both sides take a fresh look at all that we can do together to enrich our historic relationship. The present regional scenario also makes the challenge of securing peace more complicated. We firmly believe the gains made so far 
be protected and the evolving situation, particularly the events since January the 3rd in the region handled in a way that any negative impact on the peace process in Afghanistan is avoided. Having come this far, there should be no, uh, there should be zero tolerance for any setbacks. Prime Minister Imran Khan has always envisioned a peaceful neighborhood. After winning the elections in July 2018, he promised that if India took one step forward for peace, Pakistan will take two. He lived up to that pledge and made repeated efforts to change the symbolism and substance of this historically troubled relationship. Unfortunately, India spurned every positive gesture driven as it was by myopia, ill-placed arrogance, and most importantly, the mystic electoral calculations. Harboring hyper-nationalism by stoking anti-Pakistan sentiment to win elections, India nearly pushed the two countries into a war last February. That we managed to step back from the brink is almost entirely due to the restraint shown by Pakistan and the statesmanlike handling by Prime Minister Imran Khan of the captured pilot issue. Alas, the BGP government repeatedly interpreted our commitment for peace as a sign of weakness. We had hoped that after the Indian elections, the BJP government would display more maturity. It would recognize that Pakistan and India should be fighting poverty and hunger together rather than fighting each other. Instead, the RSS-inspired BJP government has embarked upon the project of turning India into a Hindu Rashtra. The adherents of Hindutva and Akhand Bharat have established this ascendancy with disastrous consequences for all in India and the world to see. On August 5th, India tried to change the disputed status of Jammu and Kashmir and alter its demographic structure, breaking all relevant international laws and violating several UN Security Council resolutions in the process. India has been seeking to break the will of the Kashmiri people by imprisoning them in their homes and imposing a communications blockade that continues to this day. Thousands of Kashmiris, particularly young boys, have been imprisoned, tortured. Even children as young as nine have not been spared. The Indian narrative that Kashmir is India's internal part is firmly refuted by its being on the Security Council agenda. If this were not the case, why would the French president raise uh, it with the Indian Prime Minister? Equally insulting to the intelligence of the world community is the bizarre Indian argument that it is for economic development of the Kashmiris. Yes, economic development being delivered at gunpoint by over 900,000 occupation troops. If not addressed, the crisis in Kashmir has the potential to become a flashpoint between the two countries with strategic capabilities. When the Kashmir crisis began in August, Prime Minister Imran Khan warned the world about the BGP government's nexus with the RSS and its fascist ideology. Initially, some of our friends felt we were exaggerating. Today, Prime Minister Imran Khan's warning is being vindicated by events inside India, uh, and everybody recognizes that. The mask has slipped and the reality of Narendra Modi's worldview is fully exposed. The internet shutdown in occupied Kashmir is already the longest ever imposed by a democracy. If today we can call India one. The passage of the Citizen Amendment Act and the National Register of Citizens are 
raising fundamental questions about the ideals like democracy and secularism that India's founding father passionately advocated. It is perhaps symptomatic of the divergent trajectory of our two countries that when the Indian Supreme Court was handing over the land on which the historic Babri Mosque had once stood in Ayodhya uh, to the same mob of Hindu religious fanatics that had raised the mosque to the ground in 1992. Pakistan was opening the Kartarpur corridor for Sikh pilgrims from India and across the world. Indian state terrorism and repression of in Indian occupied Jammu and Kashmir and the BGP government's incitement of religious hatred and frenzy in India have dangerous implications for the region. Let's not forget that this Indian government has a history of externalizing its domestic problems. You only need to cast your mind back to the Pulwama episode in the run-up to the Indian elections last year, when India sought to deceive the world by a never-ending stream of lies. We fear that we are once again reaching such a crisis. Every other day, some new Indian politician or military official makes a veiled threat against Pakistan. Meanwhile, we all followed reports of capture of Indian police officer Devinder Singh, whose footprint is now being seen in some major terrorist attack, which India itself orchestrated and blamed on Pakistan. We have been consistently warning the world community about another false flag operation against Pakistan, that Devinder Singh was accompanied by two militants on his way to Delhi in close proximity to the Republic Day celebrations should not be lost on anyone. Our government wants peace in the neighborhood. We want, we need peace in order to focus on achieving our domestic agenda for economic reform and development. But we are not prepared to pay any price for peace with India. Certainly not our dignity and certainly not without resolving the Kashmir dispute in a just manner. We know that President Trump is profoundly worried uh, by the Kashmir situation and we welcome his repeated offers of mediation in resolving the Kashmir dispute. The United States alone commands the moral authority and respect in South Asia to resolve the long, longest pending dispute on the UN agenda. As Prime Minister Imran uh, told President Trump last July, the United States will have the gratitude and prayers of over two billion people in South Asia if it did so. We hope President Trump is successful in realizing his goal and can make a lasting contribution to substantial peace in South Asia. That could be uh, his enduring legacy. Pakistan-US relationship has always uh, served our mutual interests. We often hear US officials say Pakistan has much to gain by working with the United States. That is undoubtedly true. But what is also true is that the United States also has much to gain by working with Pakistan. That is what history of our relations teaches us. We appreciate the assistance the United States has historically provided us in the areas as diverse as agriculture, energy, defense, and education. The United States played a critical role in building our agriculture base as well as our defense capa uh, capacity during the 50s and the 60s. But Pakistan also contributed immensely and obviously unquantifiably by helping the United States during the Cold War, including by facilitating US-China rapprochement, which decisively tilted the balance in favor of the free world. Pakistan would not have achieved the success it did in fighting terrorism without assistance from the United States. But equally, Al-Qaeda would not 
be the shadow of its former self today if Pakistan had not helped with the campaign against its leadership and cadres. Despite our shared frustrations with the pace of overall progress in Afghanistan, let us not forget that the terrorist organization that attacked the United States on the horrible September morning in 2001 stands degraded and diminished today. This is our joint success. Pakistan desires a relationship with the United States that is based on mutual respect, mutual interest, and mutual benefit. While we continue to work with the United States for peace in Afghanistan and for security in post-Afghanistan war region, our relationship should be larger than Afghanistan and counterterrorism. It is also a concern for us that there is a growing tendency to view Pakistan-China relations through the lens of contemporary geopolitics. I want to remind you that Pakistan's relationship with China is nearly as old as our relationship with the United States. Force fitting Pakistan-China relations into the currently popular framework of great power competition distorts the picture. For too long, we have lamented the lack of connectivity between the regional economies. Now, in the form of CPAC, we have a project that will help Pakistan's economy develop uh, economic development goals and provide impetus to economic integration in South and Central Asia. Far from being suspicious of CPAC, uh, supporters of peace in the region should welcome the project. Uh, for all the talk of great power transitions and realignments, the logic for a strong Pakistan-US uh, relationship is unarguable. Besides securing peace in Afghanistan, we have strategic convergence on preserving peace and stability in South Asia and promoting mutually beneficial trade and investment ties. Pakistan is a nation of over 200 million people, two thirds of whom are under 30 years of age. We sit at the crossroads of China, South and Central Asia. Pakistan is a conduit to a market of another 3 billion people. The economic potential is immense. The U.S. is our major trading partner and a significant source of remittances. We would like to create more trade and investment opportunities for both countries. Indeed, when President Trump and Prime Minister Imran Khan met in Washington in July, President Trump had spoken of increasing trade by 20 times. Pakistan is an energy deficient country. The US is emerging as a big energy supplier. This newfound complementarity adds another reason for our two countries to cooperate and collaborate. Meanwhile, one million plus Pakistani Americans remain a bridge between uh, the two countries. Pakistani Americans have always been high achievers in the areas of professional endeavor. But what has uh, struck me is this time that many more young Pakistani Americans are politically engaged. That was not uh, the case earlier. As a politician, I'm always happy to see young people who have a passion for public service and civic engagement. This innate yearning for democratic participation among young Pakistani Americans is a reminder of the many values that stem from their hyphenated identities. In this commonality of values, that is ultimately the bedrock of any strong relationship. Friends are precious commodities. One does not turn one's back on old friends just because one has made new ones. Let me reiterate that in our common pursuit of security, stability, uh, and prosperity, Pakistan and the United States have much to gain by working together. I thank you for your attention 
I would be happy to take any questions if you may.